crew for inviting me. Uh, I've never been to Indiana before. This is really neat for me. Um, and I appreciate you coming out to this talk to learn about container security. Um, I'm pretty excited because it was originally a lot more sanitized. Um, but I just started my own company, so I don't really need to worry about pissing off Google or anyone um, or kind of presenting in that sort of way. So you're going to get the first version of this where, you know, I kind of tear into Google a little bit, and I think they deserve it. Uh, and I thought that's also what you'd want to see, because that's what's true. Um, so as I go through the talk, uh, I kind of like to know where people are at in terms of how much you know about containers or container security. Uh, just a show of hands, has anyone here set up Docker or Kubernetes? All right, cool. Uh, so for the most part, people have a pretty high level of comfort. Anyone here who um, is new came here to kind of learn about it? OK, that's a decent number of folks, too. All right, um, I think we can make this work for everyone. So you are at Containers, Exploits, Surprises, and Security uh, with me. Um, hashtag, I believe, is CircleCityCon, yes? And you are welcome to tag me on Twitter or on Facebook uh, or quote me or whatever. I'm a private person in some respects, but not when I'm on stage, uh, not here and not with this. So um, if you think something is useful or you want to share it, um, I appreciate that. Mark Andreessen famously said software is eating the world in 2011. And at the time, that seemed kind of true and wise. And now it's more like containers are eating software. But actually, it's more like Monero miners are eating the containers. <laughs> uh, and we'll dig into that as we go through the presentation. So what is Docker? Uh, Docker claims to be the world's leading software containerization platform. All right. And their promise, among other things, is security. In theory, that's part of what's really useful about containers is you get like this really cool way to do defense in depth. Uh, they promise to deliver applications safer across the entire life cycle with built-in security capabilities and configurations out of the box. That makes you think that you don't need to do extra configuration, right? Like just set it up and go and it's we're good. So when people are misconfiguring their containers, uh, I don't really think it's their fault when the marketing looks like this. But I'm just imagining like the marketing people writing things without any relationship to like the tech team or the product team or like what actual capabilities are. And actually, if any of you have ever worked in marketing, that's pretty true. I'm in marketing. It's the accountability and the feedback loop is not what it should be. Configurations out of the box. And I had more to say about Docker, uh, but I just came back from KubeCon in Copenhagen, which is the Kubernetes event. Uh, and one of my realizations there, part of what people were talking about, is that Docker Inc. is actually dead. Uh, so I plan to come here and talk to you about Docker vulnerabilities and Docker exploits, but I don't know if anyone really cares. Um, of course, it's certainly interesting as hackers to kind of know where things are going, if things are not going to be as well maintained in the future, if leadership isn't there. Um, it could mean a certain, you know, opening for that sort of thing. But um, one of the founders just left, and they don't really have a business model now that Kubernetes has come in and kind of eaten their lunch. So we're going to focus a little more on Kubernetes because that's what's taking over the container space. Uh, Kubernetes also claims to be the industry leading, except I think they're correct, industry leading open source container orchestrator, which powers Kubernetes engine. And in theory, it's really good, right? Like here's the diagram of how the isolation works. And in theory, you get this great defense in depth. Also, uh, I'm just kind of making the point that Kubernetes matters. Uh, I'll go through this pretty quickly. Google Cloud is making the claim that containers is the Google way. From Gmail to YouTube to search, everything at Google runs in containers. That's like a startling number. Something like, each week we start over 2 billion containers. 
Uh, so containers are really, really big. That's why I'm doing this talk now. Um, I'm actually new to containers, so I'm mostly sharing these like cool, neat things that I've discovered with you. Um, who, you know, many of you are going to have more expertise in different ways, or at the least, your own time to kind of play with this stuff. So I'm sharing what I'm learning and kind of hoping it'll be interesting to you, and that you'll go off and and poke holes at them uh, because they need that. Also because it's fun. So yeah, there are fancy exploits. And when I originally started thinking about this talk, I thought that's what this would be about. And you kind of hope that that's where things are going to be. Like you hope that you're going to have to work kind of hard and be like, you know, a cat on a unicorn to make things go. But no, it's really about good old misconfiguration. And the core Kubernetes team calls many security issues misconfiguration. But what do you call it when misconfiguration is the default? And when the engineers all know that that's how it is, and everyone just decides that that's what it's going to be. So Kubernetes has so many fun attack vectors, many of which are intentionally enabled by default because I love trash. <laughs> Or maybe it's not quite that, but um, that's certainly what it looks like from a security lens. Uh, so I'm going to show you why I've come to this conclusion. Hacking Kubernetes. So we're used to taking strong measures to protect user data, but what about keeping hackers away from those S3 buckets? Here's an example, someone on Twitter found hackers fighting over the clusters, like there are too many people who've gotten into the same one and they're fighting over it. And raise your hand, have, has anyone here heard about the Tesla hack? Okay, so if you're like really following, yeah, right, you're smiling, because it's just so bad. Um, so if you're following Kubernetes uh, closely, um, this was like really big news, because Tesla is such a major brand, um, and they were pwned in just like the stupidest way. Uh, so this is like the new famous example of a Kubernetes vulnerability. So the hack is that Monero miners infiltrated a Kubernetes console, which was not password protected, uh, and there were access credentials, which gave them access to AWS. Now this bucket had sensitive data, and they didn't care, because they just wanted those you know sweet, sweet altcoins. Monero is a like privacy altcoin. So the hackers did some smart things. They hid their IP address behind Cloudflare. Um, they were on a non-standard port. And also they kept their CPU usage low, you know, helps evade detection. So there are various lessons from this, which I think are not really like lessons to a group of security people. But uh, I posted them anyway. Now I'm going to show you one more. This Exploit is really like a good example of the security mindset of the Kubernetes team. The GitHub comments are interesting. Uh, so you had a single node Kubernetes deployment running on top of Alpine Linux. Uh, Alexander Ursioli from Handy wrote up a cool Medium article about this. This was a coworker of his had his like personal Kubernetes. So they all saw this happening like at the team at Handy, but it wasn't a Handy cluster. It was just an employee running something personal. And there was the indication of compromise. And then curling the endpoints leads to mining proxy online. And they were able to actually see the, Kuber the Monero mining script. And it was like, well, how did this happen? So the Kubernetes API server was publicly exposed to the internet, but it was protected. Uh, but by default, uh, there was this insecure way that things were structured, even though people had been filing bug reports since 2015, namely uh, where you could just use the username of system anonymous and a group of system unauthenticated and you'd get in, which is terrible. Here's just some more details about how this bug used to work. Now here you see that they finally closed it. So this issue is finally been closed after being open since 2015. And someone says, is there any CVE for this? This is before they closed it. People are like, this is a problem. No. Running in production 
without enabling Kublet auth and authors is a misconfiguration, not a CVE. And this was from Jordan, and you'll see his organizations. He's part of Google Cloud and part of Kubernetes. Um, and so you had, you know, Google, Kubernetes, like core members, seeing these bug reports coming in and saying, look, this isn't a vulnerability. The user just needs to configure it differently. But when you've got, you know, hundreds and thousands of people with these misconfigurations, I think the responsibility is to come back onto Google to, you know, try and protect them and try and make it easier for people to do their setups. As you can see, I'm salty about this. You know, we're security professionals. We don't, we don't want to see a company as big as Google with all of those resources being neglectful in this way. Um, now, the reason why they've been doing things this way is because of backwards compatibility, among other reasons. Um, but, you know, the security vulnerabilities are bad. All right, so exploiting Kubernetes, they do have a disclosure process. Here are some tools that I thought would be interesting. Uh, so you can go into Kubernetes on Shodan, and you get some very interesting results. Uh, most people here, you've, you've been on Shodan, yeah? Yeah, just Shodan.io, it's not very expensive. So you can try this at home if you want. Uh, you can get all kinds of credentials because there's just so much that's actually exposed to the public internet, which is not really surprising, but... I had to like double check this a few times because I didn't think that it was real, but um, the HTTP service on 2379 TCP is the default, and it is accessible and not secured by default. You will get passwords, AWS keys, and such. And from the website themselves, they talk here about how authentication was added, but previously it was a completely open system, and the feature is off by default for backwards compatibility. Same here, by default, unauthenticated access. Here's some common vulnerabilities to look for on Shodan and a fun Medium post um, with more details on it. As I said, a lot of what I've done here is kind of found some neat things and wanted to share it with everyone. But they're not all things that I found myself. This is also a list of some of the tools. I spent a long time trying to figure out which tools were actually good. Um, so Docker has made some tools for Docker, but like we don't really, Docker isn't as important anymore. Um, so I think that the tools for Kubernetes are a lot more important, a lot more interesting. You've got Kubebench, and that checks Kubernetes against the CIS Kubernetes benchmarks. Um, now the CIS Kubernetes benchmarks are really, really good as a guideline for hardening Kubernetes. The problem is, uh, oh, and this is what it looks like. The problem is that it's just so long. Um, it's like pages and pages and pages. Um, so we really need someone to write like a TLDR guide. Um, and hopefully we'll start to see that soon. There are some security experts in the container space and they're writing books. So within the next year, hopefully we'll get a bit of an easier how-to guide because the CIS benchmarks are really, really dense. Um, also, Heptio is a really good company in the space founded by one of the Kubernetes founders, and they make some really useful tools. They make a configuration management tool because misconfiguration is such a common problem. So I would recommend that one. Ah, oh, yeah, here we go. Sorry for the misorder here. You see it's like 259 pages with the CIS benchmarks for Kubernetes. It's just really, really difficult to get this right. <laughs> Um, I think one way to handle this is to use some kind of managed service. Like you can use Microsoft has a managed service. Um, Microsoft is reasonable for enterprise type security things. Um, but basically, like Kubernetes is really hard to configure and it's a problem. Highlights, enable built-in Linux security measures, SE Linux, SE Comp profiles. And that gives you a little more fine-grained control, but again, you have to be able to understand what to do with the fine-grained control. 
Uh, also, vulnerability scanning by Google. My recommendation in general is the tools by Hetzio and by Google. Those are the best from what I can tell. Also, Graphius. Uh, so this one is for auditing your supply chain, which is useful because you need to know that there aren't vulnerabilities inside your containers. So I have a bunch of other slides, but I wanted to leave it on this one because this is my favorite. Um, and I tend to be a little informal with talks that are, this is, there we go. You can still hear me okay? With talks that are like, you said that was saying yes? Okay, cool, thank you. So, you know, because this is a community, it's like a community hacker event. And so I didn't necessarily want it to be like all me on stage. I figured there are going to be people in the room who have some interesting experiences. And I'd want to open it up, especially because it's the end of the day, right? Like it's been a long day already. Uh, if anyone here has some interesting stories about container vulnerabilities or container security, uh, I thought that would mix it up a bit. I'd love, I'd love to hear someone from the audience. Yeah, in the back. I have a small plug for something that you guys can look at if you're looking at containers. Um, VMware has something called uh, Turn that we just released not too long ago. Um, VMware's Turn is an open source uh, compliance tool for um, auditing containers. So it, it generates a bill of materials for all of the different software packages that went into generating that um, container. So then you can check that against you know open source uh, libraries and and programs to make sure your container is not vulnerable. What was it called again? It's called Turn, like the Turn. bird. T E R N. Uh, it's I on met, GitHub. I met one of the executives from VMware at KubeCon, and he was really, really, really smart. Um, Which one? Don't remember his name. Is it Dirk? Uh, no, we, we can oh, just okay. move on from that. Uh, All right. Does anyone else have uh, anything that you've seen with container vulnerabilities or exploits or security? Thought I saw him before. Yeah. A lot of things are possible are possible to secure, but in the it's, it's in this misconfiguration. It's in the speed of getting it up. It's like well, when you're running a container, you should do things like Gosu and other things to make sure that it's not running as root in case there's an underlying kernel vulnerability. And Kubernetes itself is a beast, and you can if you disregard all the security, you can get it set up fairly easy, but getting all the dials just right can be complex, and you are seeing more people going, well, the solution is to just, you know, go ahead and use the hosted vendor, because even if you get it set up right with their rap with their fairly rapid uh, turnaround, it's like, how who, who, not everyone has the time to fully test and upgrade their entire Kubernetes infrastructure every 18 months, I believe it is, so... Or sooner, saying, right? Like, you need to really be maintaining this. Yeah, so it's, Kubernetes is certainly hotness, but not, I, in my opinion, it's not quite ready for the masses that aren't ready to take on this thing. When you have places that, yeah, we still have servers that we haven't upgraded in two or three years. They don't have the whole CI, CD workflow. And it's like, let's look at Kubernetes. It's like, that's, that's scary. Well, you had like Spectre and Meltdown, and suddenly, you know, everyone need to, needed to do so many patches and upgrades, and it was a tremendous amount of work. Um, and using a managed service, you get to offload some of that. Uh, but people are saying that Kubernetes is ready for production, but just a year or two ago, they had almost no security in place. You know, they, they really were uh, like leaving all of these bugs and vulnerabilities unpatched and unfixed. Um, so uh, I think they're getting there, but it's still a lot of work for, you know, I wouldn't recommend it for a small company to do on their own. Yeah. Yes? The last couple of Kubernetes versions have very much improved upon their security, and if you patch your stuff, it will improve a lot. Like a lot of the stuff that used to be open by default isn't open by default anymore, and um, a lot of the stuff that was in like super beta a year or two ago is like 
out now, so role-based access control and like node restrictions and other kinds of things are easier to implement now. Um, the defaults could use a little work. And one thing about the CIS benchmarks is that they are mostly um, applicable to Kubernetes core. So if you're running it on, um, if you're just running nat native Kubernetes on your cluster and you're not either hosting it on some other cloud provider or, uh, you know, putting any kind of add-ons or plugins or anything on there, um, if it is all just out of the box, the CIS benchmarks will apply perfectly. If it is not all out of the box, a lot of the CIS benchmarks won't apply. Um, which is unfortunate because almost nobody runs Kubernetes um, entirely out of the box. And so that's one thing to watch out for if you're trying to do your configurations yourself. Do you have any recommendations for um, people who have like smaller businesses or smaller you know, startups, people who aren't inside the enterprise but want to do this? who want to run it, who want to secure Yeah, it. like for people who are part of smaller teams who want to run Kubernetes, what, what would you suggest? Um, uh, GCP is pretty good these days. <laughs> um, they have uh, some pretty good security things that are built into it. Um, it's probably a decent idea to use some sort of thing that's bigger than you. Um, and. Uh, there are startups that kind of do a lot of the security configuration for you. And so if you are a small business who don't want to deal with that yourself, like Aqua is really good um, for Kube security. Um, there are a couple of other ones. Capsulate's really good. And trying to use a, trying to go through a vendor in this case is actually probably a pretty good idea unless you have full-time people who are dedicated to this. Aqua puts out some of the best security material. Um, and the talks by folks at Aqua have been really good. I've been really impressed. I haven't played with their tools, but I appreciate your recommendation. Anyone else? Yes, please. Yes. Like Aqua. Uh, like who? Like Aqua. Um, so I recently watched You have to uh, be well, really the experts, right? right. You, well, you need to choose managed services that are making security a priority, um, and then discuss that with them and make sure that your needs are met. Um, I think that that's right. That um, security is on the back burner for uh, a lot of the developers, and then a lot of the people who are doing implementation, and then even some of the managed services, and that's how you end up. With the situation where I can go on Showdown and just see like so many Kubernetes instances just exposed publicly. Um, I was uh, friends with some folks at Aptable, um, which is part of how I got into containers. And they were building uh, like hardened Docker containers, or they still are, uh, for people who need to be HIPAA compliant, for startups that need to be HIPAA compliant. Um, and so they do a whole range of things, including like managing the encryption, and uh, like duplicating the databases, and uh, when Spectre and Meltdown happened, they dealt with all the patching. Uh, and so there are smaller providers that are really like security focused, and I think that that's that's useful. Um, but ultimately, uh, Kubernetes is starting to grow up, and it's within a very big, well-resourced company, namely Google. So I'm optimistic about the future, but I think it's important to push them a bit. Uh, because they are going to focus on security more as they see that it matters and that it's getting attention. Yeah. Any other? Uh, yes, please. Yeah, do you have any experience with Pivotal, like particularly Pivotal container service? They're pushing Kubernetes, and they're kind of saying as a default, we'll give you the most recent version of Kubernetes with extensions and everything. Right. So it's kind of like, that's table stakes, though, you know, to be doing the most recent version. Um, I think that that's good. Um, 
the most recent. Right, the most recent stable version. Uh, you know, Pivotal is a good firm overall, but they're not necessarily security focused. Um, and so you may end up with some trade-offs that you don't want if you're, if security is more important to you. Uh, I haven't played with Pivotal specifically, but I haven't seen them in any of my work or research in Kubernetes. Like, I didn't see them at KubeCon. Um, I'm not seeing their name come up when I'm reading, uh, like, security papers. Like, Aqua keeps coming up. Um, and Microsoft has a really big presence, and they're also security focused. Um, I mean, you can say what you want about Microsoft, but, like, their enterprise security is, like, fairly stable, so I feel good about that. Um, and their Kubernetes service also does, like, all the auto automatic updates, which is really important. Um, so I think these services are good. I, if I were you and I was looking at Pivotal, I'd just see, does it, like, really meet my needs? Yeah, and I've used Cloud Foundry quite a bit, and I just recently announced the container service, and I'm just trying to learn, you know, yeah. best Yeah, it's a lot to sort through. Oh, well, thank you for coming. Yes, please. Did you say you looked at other orchestration, like vSphere and containers? Yeah, I've been interested in orchestration tools. That's actually how I started to get into this. Well, I wonder if they uh, went security better or anything like that. I think that the, the, the orchestration tools can be a really good security tool because you have a team that's working full time thinking about these issues and with like all the resources to put into it, um, it, but it's a question of knowing where you're at. Um, if you have the resources and the time and the ability to do everything yourself, you know, that's good, but that's not true for a lot of people in a lot of organizations, especially when crunch time hits. Um, so that's the usefulness of these, like, managed platforms, is they're going to handle the upgrades and the patches and the encryption you know, and all of these things for you, but you're putting your trust in them, uh, which is a challenging thing to do. So I think it's a question of vetting them carefully and, like, understanding how are they actually, like, how are they doing the security for you? What are the features? Uh, any other stories, um, your own experience? Anyone have experience? Just that you think is relevant to this. Anything you want to share? Yes, please. I was just kind of looking at this from the attentional level of follow-up. Yes. Something that is it's an industry, it's actually, in my time, it's like an industry profile that can continually develop upon itself. Um, you look back to like Windows, like NT 2000, a lot of it's great vulnerabilities. That's right, the backwards compatibility is a big and rabbit hole. That to a, that what the individual may say, rapid deployment that it has with that door. Yeah. And not having the, the levels, not having the necessary, say, template tools, like, just to get something up, even though it's failure, make sure that at least you're going to have things on the call for rapid deployment, make sure that it's like, here, here's a template, um, or set a template, it will get you limited. Right. I think what's challenging right now is that the information being put out by, like, Docker and Kubernetes and these organizations about how to be secure is just, like, really dense and not necessarily well prioritized um, and just, like, above the capabilities of some of the groups that are putting things up there, um, combined with the fact that people assume that a product by Google is going to be, def like, secure out of the box. I think um, people are... I understand and respect why people would think the defaults would be appropriate. I mean, I agree to disagree with you. Like, okay, I'm not trying to sell this, but like, I use CentOS on the cloud environment, and I don't want people to know, even though there, there's actually a little hidden switch port behind sticks that actually has some level of, they're not, they're not, oh my god, the greatest, so you know, but that they're a little outdated, but at least they do patch a lot of ways that you can do it with by the web from. Right. Right. We're in the early days of containers, and it's very similar to the early days of software. 
right? Like software eventually um, has become more secure. Of course, we have more attackers now. Uh, containers will become more secure and perhaps more attackers. Yeah. Oh, I'm not, I'm clearly not making an excuse. I'm trying to theme them right here. I love trash. <laughs> Yeah, that it's a mess. It is a mess. That's my point. We don't learn. So Thank for you. For us, I mean, in the sense that it keeps us, keeps our jobs secure. We got all this crap with this and deal with it. But when are we going to learn? Like, we're not. It's for me. It's like, this is new. This is new. We keep doing the same things. We put out cool tools yeah. that are fantastic. Don't get me wrong. Containers are awesome. Containers are very cool. Uh, I saw you had your hand up before. Uh, are you Ian? Is that right? Yeah. Um, for better or worse, and I think that there are lessons to be learned from this, um, Kubernetes originally did not really come with secure stuff out of the box because it was not believed when Kubernetes first came out, much actually probably in the early days of software, that Kubernetes would be run in production. And <laughs> So we have cool people doing research at universities, companies, and elsewhere, and their focus isn't AppSec. Their focus is what's cool. Pablo? So I, I think all sides are pointing the spear at the other side of the fence. So first of all, if it's open source and available for download, it is not a product that somebody is selling you, and it is probably not meant for Universities don't produce products, they produce research. I just came with a uh, faculty at the university, we did a lot of research. And we put it out there, our standard disclosure is, this is research, this is not to be, meant to be used as a production tool. So if you're downloading this stuff for free, and you're putting it in a production environment without taking a look at the code on your own, then frankly, shame on you. So, uh, yeah, in the front. The average enterprise average like a thousand open source dependencies. So the same shame on them is nice, but it's not the reality of the world. The reality of the world is everybody has massive dependencies and software supply chains. And it's mostly free software that has doesn't have any money to get tested. Sure. Uh, in the back?
Yes, please. In the back. That's a great suggestion. Uh, it won't solve the problem of, at times, there are certain security implementations that they don't want to do, but it'll get more hands on deck. Um, and it does look like they're expanding that group. Uh, I saw Hannah in the back. So it was 
sort of a toy that turned into something real. Um, and right. Yeah, and that's, that's what ends up happening a lot in engineering, is that you have this little toy of one that becomes this real thing. Like VMware had workstation that was a toy virtual vision environment that became vSphere. So. Right. We're seeing, you know, these very old, uh, you know, GitHub bugs getting closed, right? Like bugs from 2015 are getting closed now. Um, and at KubeCon, which was just a few weeks ago, a lot of the talks were about security. And like people were saying okay. that was the theme. Yeah. All those talks are online. Yes. So you go to YouTube and search for CNCF, Cloud Native Computing <laughs> Foundation. Literally, they have like a thousand of them because they have this year's KubeCon, they have last year's KubeCon, and they have a lot of security talks. Yeah, and the security's been evolving really quickly, so this year's talks are going to be the good ones, or in my opinion, the best ones to look at, because they're the most recent. Um, and, and that was the theme. Like, people were talking about how that's the theme this year. So we're starting to realize that Kubernetes is being used in production, and people are starting to put more effort into security. But, you know, in the meantime, there's, there's still a lot there. You go on Showdown, there's a lot there. Yes? So how about accountability? Something that I hear a lot is just, you know, teams, especially from business and, you know, solution teams, constantly saying, oh, well, it's, it's cloud, like Kubernetes does all that, and Docker handles all that for us. And so how do you communicate that accountability and say, we still have to do secure configuration, we still have to do patching, you know, and, and you mentioned bone scanning, you know, bone scanning of images. Right, how do you um, talk up inside your organization so they understand that the defaults aren't secure and that you need to put some work in and that you're not just like being lazy or procrastinating but there's more to do. Um, I would probably, uh, I'll see if I can get this up online or like find me on Twitter. Uh, I can bring that back up. My Twitter handle is Alyssa Beth, E-L-I-S-S-A-B-E-T-H. Um, and anyone can send me a DM or just tweet me there for questions that aren't fully handled here. Because um, I can send you some links. Uh, there are sections where, you know, the Google uh, security blog for Kubernetes um, talks about all the things that you need to do. So I would go to some of these primary sources and just show them, like, look, we need to do all of this work to get the uh, configuration to where it needs to be. Um, and maybe you could show examples, um, like, you could show how uh, other companies are getting hacked and it's embarrassing. Right, like Tesla got hacked and it was all over the news and you don't want to be them. And that's like the motivation for putting that work in. Uh, but that's a hard question, right? It's always a hard question of how to get more time and resources to do security in your org. Yeah, I mean, I hear so many people say, well, it's AWS, AWS is everything for security. Well, no, so you can figure your cloud you know, from a hyperlabs level up. I mean, there's still a lot of security that they need. Yeah, for your threat model, for whatever you're doing. Thank you. Um, if there isn't anything else, uh, at the end of the day, I'll be happy to, you know, let all of you folks go, even though I, I keep, keep you here all day. This is fun for me. Pablo's smiling. You're the one who's really in charge. That's true. <laughs> uh, any other uh, thoughts or questions? No? All right. Well, I'm going to hang out here. Anyone who wants to is welcome to hang out here and continue the conversation. Uh, but, you know, it's the end of the day. If you want to get up and walk around and stretch so you have some energy for the parties and stuff later, um, I will not be offended. Uh, but someone come talk to me. Hi, Michael. I haven't seen you in a while. Thanks for coming. Yeah. Uh,